what's up? Hey folks, Jerry here. Welcome to the Pioneers of Insight podcast, a show that explores the wipeouts, crackups, and recoveries of inspiring and influential people. Here you'll get the stories of the quest to find success beyond the struggle and the great leaps of innovation that take us there. People that sound like this. JLD. What's up, man? Jerry. What's up, man? What's up brother? Thank Dude. you so much. Well, I'm excited this to be here, Jerry. Fantastic. Thanks for inviting Thank you so much for having me. Fun today. Keep telling your story as well. Yeah, man, 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 man. man. How are you doing today, Stephanie? Shoot. Are I you, gotcha. Am I there now? Yeah, you're here now. <laughs> Today, we deep dive the life story of Stephanie Somerville, an Indiana native who landed on New York City's storytelling stage after escaping racism and fundamentalist schooling. All right, strap in, folks, as we head into a story about healing and freedom and the wounds that threaten to keep us grounded. You know, I'm a complete stranger, and it's always a bit of a leap of faith. When you <laughs> yeah, um, I think as an actor, that's a, it's very easy because I work with complete strangers all the time. So I agree. yeah, you've worked that muscle out pretty good. Stephanie Somerville, welcome to the Pioneers of Inside podcast. Glad to have you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for having me. So our listeners know that the first segment we call the show, which is just an open-ended invitation for you to talk about how you see yourself showing up in the world every day. Mm. Yeah, so I, every day I show up as a warrior, as an uplifter, yeah, a person with a can-do spirit. All of these elements come from my father. That's the way he showed up every day. And so that's the person that people see on the outside is always, um, in fact, as part of my LinkedIn profile of description, I call myself an uplifter of the human spirit through speaking story and song. You're a storyteller and you're a very skilled storyteller, but you're also pairing this with uplifter. And to be honest, that's not something that you always hear from storytellers. Sometimes with Sometimes with storytellers, they're deeply rooted in just the, the purity of the experience and they don't allow themselves that, that aspect of you. So that's something that I want to track um, and maybe just give you an opportunity to talk about that right now. Yeah, Where? I can. How, how are you combining those things? Do you see those things at odds and maybe where did that start to show up in your life? Um, I think, well, it came about organically. Uh, I first of all became a storyteller by accident when uh, I was at a party in Brooklyn in, I think, 2000, yeah, in the fall of 2007. And I have a very interesting story. I always thought it was an interesting cocktail party story. Uh, Because I'm from Southern Indiana, where racism and prejudice exist. It's just part of the norm. Uh, people don't talk about it. And yeah, so people don't know that the Ku Klux Klan actually started there, right? They didn't actually, they started in Aaron in Tennessee, some small place in Tennessee mm-hmm. around the depression era. They set up their home, I should say, I guess in outside of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Gotcha. And that was right during the depression. So they kind of grew from there, which I think is ironic that, you know, it's a Northern state. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but that's where they started. So that that energy kind of was pervasive, and it it covered like going forward throughout the decades. It was kind of like a shadow that hung over everything. As everybody else in the rest of America, like in the South, they were recovering on the East and West Coast. People were already a little more progressive. Indiana sort of, and the the surrounding area, Indiana, Kentucky, and even parts of Illinois, they still had this old school antebellum South uh, hatred even. It it wasn't even, there wasn't even a Southern gentility about it. I don't know why, but it took root there and it sort of remained. So 
You know, I grew up in Southern Indiana starting in the late 1960s. Early 70s was when were my formative years, right? And during that time, it might as well have been 20 years before. It was very much a Jim Crow kind of vibe growing up where I lived, and I always sensed it. In my hometown of Evansville, Indiana, they had to force integration the year that I went into kindergarten. Part of the concession was that the schools that were white said, okay, you can integrate, but we're not going to send a bus to come pick you up, so you have to take the city bus to do it. So I got on the city bus with my sister who was in uh, seventh grade at the time, and that's how I would get to school. And from the moment I got to school, I could I was aware, even in kindergarten, of how different I was. And I, I always had to, I felt like I had to do things in a very uh, overt and non-threatening way. I remember as a kid when we were sitting at the table having lunch and I wanted to get the salt shaker. I remember consciously picking it up in a way that looked non-threatening. And so that everybody could see that Steph is picking up the salt shaker now and it's okay. And ever since then, there's always been that energy that I carried forward in everything that I did. Fast forward to Brooklyn, 2007. I'm telling these people my Klansman story, which you can find on the moth, about how I had to take care of a Klansman who was dying of cirrhosis. And when I showed up at his house, his wife did not know that I was black and I didn't know they were Klans people, they, but they had no choice but to let me in because they wouldn't explain to the agency why they wouldn't let me into the house. And the agency that sent me to their house was like, well, you have someone and we don't have anybody else. So unless you give us a valid reason as to why this person is not going to work for you, then you have to take them. So that's how I ended up encountering this Klansman. So I'm telling this story at the party, and after I finish, this woman comes up to me and she says, how would you like to tell this story to a room full of strangers on a stage? And I thought to myself, like, what? And so uh, that lady turned out to be Catherine, uh, Catherine Burns, the executive uh, producer of The Moth. Accepting the Peabody Award is artistic director Catherine Burns. So that began my journey as a storyteller. And that particular story throughout the years seems to have resonated. And I have become, for lack of a better term, they call it in the moth world, a moth rock star. So you grow up in an environment and I hear there's a certain carefulness that may have supported a heightened sensitivity and awareness to what the heck is going on around you, right? Absolutely. So when you bring it to your present here and when you're giving it for, you know, introducing us to how you show up into the world, I hear a resourceful, resilient, a hyper aware and highly sensitive person that may, it may have been rooted out of survival in the beginning. But you're talking about from an early age that I'm hearing that really stands out, there was a certain craftsmanship in how you were presenting yourself. And that perhaps is feeding into what we're seeing today in terms of how you're identifying as a storyteller. I also hear you had to make a leap here, right? You didn't see yourself as a storyteller. You were invited into the space of being a storyteller and you took the leap. Did I get all that right? Yeah, and in fact, this whole, that whole heightened sensitivity thing will come into play later. It was also necessary for me to function as an adult for the rest of my life once we get into the, I guess, the, the dark part. Right. Well, that's what I'm already starting to listen for because that hyper attunement often comes with a dark side, right? There's a shadow that you carry around it as well. Uh, yeah. That, that heightened awareness, you carry a lot of emotional energy about defending yourself at the same time. So here I, I'm going to bring us up to the present. Storyteller, a little bit ago in Brooklyn, you got invited to take the stage. And bam, mm-hmm. you kind of hit it off. You become a rock star early on. Yeah. That story kind of catapulted me into this world of storytelling. 
And then one day, this man at a mega church saw me, uh, it saw my thing on YouTube. Please welcome to the stage, Stephanie Somerville. Okay. So I gotta say and he said, I, I am doing a whole series for my church, church. my very rich constituents at my mega church on racial on reconciliation. reconciliation. Could you come and tell your story? And when I went to do that, that was in 2017, that's when I made the jump. That's when I started to discover that the story was more than this interesting story that I would tell at the moth. Take us to that day. What, what happened? Um, when you walked in there, because I, I hear a major setup for you, right? The highly sensitive part is protecting that aspect of yourself that experienced the trauma and the tragedy around having to grow up and be careful around mm -hmm. people that might not understand who you are. Yeah. You make this leap in your life to storyteller. You're invited in, but you're also invited into this huge community that might be hypersensitive to these kind of issues. Could you take us through that day? What did it look like? I'm in this mega church that is held in a very nicely funded public school in North Arlington, Virginia, um, kind of right outside North Arlington, Virginia. So the people are beautiful. And what's, I got to also add this because it's so funny. I, in my experience in high school is I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian high school mega church that was full of the prejudiced people from Indiana. So it was a totally different which I think is funny. So it's now it's it comes full circle. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. Ooh, which, is, is. Yeah. which is crazy. So um, when I go to this mega church, these people, Pastor John Sly was absolutely gracious. Everything that I could have ever wanted, these people provided for me. Uh, so I was sitting there listening to the end of Pastor John Sly's speech. And normally I don't ever do that as a storyteller. It's kind of like being a comedian. You can't listen to the person doing the set in front of you because then it takes you off guard. But it was so amazing to listen to Pastor John Sly and all of this information that he was giving him, uh, giving his parishioners about African Americans, white people who actually had done good during this time, how people, examples of how white people were of service and how they should continue to do so. It was just amazing. It was like, I got an crazy American history lesson just in the 10 minutes before I'm supposed to go on. So then when I finally get up to tell my story, for me, it was water down a, down a hill. It's just because it was so easeful, because I was in such a warm and receptive environment but the thing that was most moving was when this whole thing was done after the show was done and we had two of them to do after each one thousands of people it seemed like came up to me and they wanted to talk to me and tell me about their story mm -hmm. almost like I was I felt almost kind of like maybe the way Christ must have felt mm -hmm. you know when people would come up to him with all of these not even problems they just wanted to like somehow connect um, because they were seeking something that they weren't sure of. And in that moment, I realized that I am not a storyteller. I am an uplift. What? These stories are meant to be in service. This is a powerful moment. So we already got into your <laughs> leap of innovation. So grew up in a difficult environment, racism prevalent, highly sensitive, acutely aware, but you're also, you opened up another window in that that bit that you just shared there, mm -hmm. that there was the impression of your own religious upbringing, right? That yeah. may or may not have had a positive impact on you. So when you took us to this leap of innovation, you're invited to become a storyteller, you take it, it opens up another door for you to become an uplifter and let go of some of this past stuff that's wrapped up in this history of racial sensitivity, but also this spiritual community of a sense of community is behind you maybe you didn't have that permission until that moment where this pastor reaches out of a mega church right yeah you come up on the stage and you're not just speaking to the people there about the story behind um the racism that you experienced but you're also revisiting your own past it sounds like you're giving yourself permission to be okay with that community again 
So there's a powerful experience that happens there. It sounds like a powerful permission yeah. that you give yourself to say, wait a minute, I can take this, this gift that I have for storytelling and I can come and reunite with an old aspect of myself. Does that sound right? A crazy talk or how do you take? No, no. How are you hearing what I'm it, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So it, and that's what I find is so amazing because I didn't realize it until now. Right. <laughs> I was telling you this. Yeah. It's a big thing that happened there. So let me ask you about that because that's another part of your story that you're sharing here. Mm-hmm. Is we go from how you see yourself showing up to maybe you're low. You're talking about some kind of there's a conflict in your past Mm -hmm. right that you made that your leap of innovation around and the conflict is around identity there's you mentioned growing up in a religious uh being exposed to what was it assembly of god or a charismatic church oh yeah it was more like a charismatic it was more like a you know like a jimmy stewart jimmy swagger a jimmy stewart uh jimmy (laughs) swagger ptl uh how much of that plays into your own low point in your life? Was that related to family? Did that create some challenges for you in terms of how you related to your, your family and your parents? What was it like for you growing up around that? Oh, this is really hard to unpack. First of all, before my father died, he died when I was 12. So that was from, so from grade school to junior high. In terms of religion, I was exposed to the charismatic Black Baptist church experience where it's a church full of people who who are living in this prejudice environment, right? So they're all living sort of a duality, and they all have to be subdued in some form or another, and they're highly judgmental and suspicious of each other. But when they come to church, this is the one place where they can have freedom. So you have, that's what I grew up in, in terms of religion, except for myself. That's the other thing. That's a whole other thing. Even when at church, I couldn't be myself because I was representative of my family. My mother had a very heavy hand. My behavior was constantly being judged and scrutinized. Mm. Add to that, I, I just have to throw this in because it's hard not to. I was being, at the age of five, I started classical training for piano. So my life centered around either going to church, to school, or home. So it was, when I got to church, I couldn't express myself there either. It was always about if I did something wrong, I was going to get a beating when I got home or got hit. I'd be taken into the bathroom. My mother would beat me up. This is part of the identity. So now my father dies. And um, after I finish eighth grade that was my last public school experience i was enrolled in this fundamentalist bible beating with arthur dimsdale from the scarlet letter running the church right i was lost in a dream i didn't know which way to go Hold on, can I ask you about this transition real quick? Because this is super, super, super important. You just opened the box to your carefulness, right? Like you had already talked about that a little bit earlier in your story when we were talking about um, your past situation around where you grew up. But there's also a culture of carefulness that you were exposed to in terms of your family and also this intense community that you were part of. You said that I didn't feel really comfortable being able to kind of be me. And your father passes at 12, and you're saying you make this leap into this even more intensely uh, intensely religious community. I've heard you talk about this, but it's important for the listener. Your dad's passing. What did he represent to you? Because you're making this leap into this culture that's probably going to take over a fatherhood role for a dad who's out of the way. How did you see dad as opposed to mom? My dad was the center of my universe, but it was also dysfunctional. He was a highly volatile person. He was never uh, violent towards me, but he, had, he was full of impatience. Um, first of all, I was kind of like the son he never had. Hmm. So when I was four or five years old, when I wasn't in the house doing chores and taking care of my sister, 
um, I was outside playing with, you know, the stuff when he'd work on the car. So I learned how to use a tire pressure gauge and I understood what a carburetor was. And when I was eight or nine years old, I'd go up to the attic. We had junk up in the attic. I took apart a, an old rotary phone, you know, so that was, he gave me hot uh, matchbox cars and hot wheels when I was growing up. So um, when I got a little older, it was a little bit different. When I was more around eight or nine, that's when I started, um, you know, I was, I was more like his daughter. He put a little bit of distance, but he was still, we did everything, uh, as many things as we could together. So we shared, um, I talk about this in the Moth story, I shared world events with him. So like we would sit down and watch the Olympics together. Um, and I learned about the rating scale of artistic impression and technical merit. And I used to go around the house rating everything, <laughs> every event on the scale of artistic impression and technical merit. <laughs> like that was one of the things. Yeah. So did you have brothers he, or sisters, by the way? Uh, I did. I was the tenth of eleven. However, wow. The children above me. First of all, there was seven years difference between me and my half sister. My, my all of my mother's children above us had a completely different father. And then my father had myself and my younger sister, who's four years younger than I am. So by the time I get to like eight or nine years old, my older sister was already 17 and she was on the way out of the house. Mm -hmm. Well, this happens with big families, right? So yeah. generationally people are moving out. So your family, you're not exposed to everybody at the same time. So you're saying that yeah. Dad was the center of your universe. You, you didn't have too many brothers or sisters around at that time, right? Was, right. Yeah. Um, and mom, uh, you're, you're kind of portraying mom as, as kind of a strict disciplinarian. She's the one to be really careful around. Did I get that right? Yeah, they, they both were. But he, he, my father was also my protector because my I mother was very violent. I think looking back at it, that there must have been some sort of hormonal mental problem because she was there was almost like a jealousy of me. So it made, it made for a very stressful environment being at home alone with my mother. My father was my protector. But there was, you're talking about a level of intimacy that you could pick up in your mom's behavior. So she was, a, she was afraid of what she saw with you and your father. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So there was some sort of, she was in some way threatened by that. So now fast forward. Here to you go car. into this religious institution, basically. Okay, yeah. So now yeah. when I was 13, it was freshman year, right? Yeah. I was put into this all white fundamentalist Christian school. And my mother's reason for doing this said, was because all of her other children, I'm paraphrasing, you know, turned out to be failures because they went through the public school system. Oh, and they were, they were all troubled children. I think it was because of her, but, but, but. So you're exiting a culture of carefulness, both in your family environment, your community. You're being rocketed into another culture that sounds like in terms of um, comfort levels, you're going to probably be at an all-time low. It doesn't sound like you're being set up um, for success here. It sounds like a pretty difficult situation to go into, but your mom has all the best intentions wrapped around it, right? Right, So yeah. here you are, you make this leap. What does it look like? Yeah, it's awful. First of all, it's full of repression to begin with, entering the teenage years on top of that. And then when I get to the Christian school, I am labeled different. I'm also labeled a Jezebel because I am, I don't know how to explain it. They explained it to me, which I believed and everybody else believed, that I was evil by default simply because I'm, an, I'm African American, uh, right? And because Moses had a black concubine and therefore he was punished and was not allowed to see the promised land. That's somewhere in the Old Testament. So I was not allowed to date. So those were the four years of high school. So I go into that at the age of 13, right? Well, help us understand this. So um, in terms of emotional safety, probably at an all time low, those environments for people that aren't exposed to them, um, people need to know they're, they're very intense. So you're talking about having to deal with as you know, it's some, your salad days, what should be your salad days, uh, yeah. potential for indoctrination. Who are you leaning on 
at that time to stay sane. What does it look like for you? Because you sound totally isolated. How are you keeping it together? No, I'm not. So that this is, I mean, I can pinpoint several times at this point already where my personality has fragmented, fragmented. for lack of a better term, fragmented. right? Yeah. So I've created like several inner children yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to take care of everything. Mm-hmm. And w- throughout those years, I ended up finding other people that were like that, that were kind of broken like that. I remember um, one of my good friends was a young man named Jason. And Jason had a very, he came from crazy wealth. His mother, who was like trailer park trash, married a very wealthy man in the city. And then he, at the age of 10, him and his sister, he sat them down, him and his mom and his sister, he sat them down on the porch and he blew his head off with a shotgun in front of them. And so Jason, it was hard for him to function in this world too. So we became friends and sort of hung out. We would hang out under pews. The school was inside a mega church that had a compound surrounding it. Right, so the school and the church were in one. It was almost like a cult because we couldn't do anything outside of the church. It was all forbidden, like any second, what we would call secular activities. Mm -hmm. So while my friends were going roller skating at the roller skating rink, that was forbidden. And if we were going to do it, you you had to do it covertly Mm -hmm. um, because our teachers were sent around the city to like spy on us. It was it was ridiculous when I look back on it. Mm -hmm. But anyway. It, during school, people would end up coming to me for like advice. And I had all of this advice and wisdom for them. I couldn't help myself. So I was <laughs> one of those people that I did other people's homework. Huh. And I took care of other people. The other thing that was beautiful about this mega church is it had tons of money. So it was into the theatricality of Christianity. So they would have events that would help to indoctrinate people that were very theatrical. Jesus rose from the dead. The question is, why did he... So we had living scenes of Easter, and that's how I learned about theater and using a scrim, because they would have these tableaus of all of the famous scenes from, you know, Christ's journey, right? And then we would have the living Christmas tree, where they would build a choir stall in the shape of a Christmas tree, and we'd have to lay it with Christmas boughs and... It was like the kids were the slave labor. Actually, the school was a slave labor. So all of these events were centered inside the church. So the church and the school kind of fed off of each other. So even though I had the regular Black, back, black Baptist church to go to, I had all of these events that had to be prepared for, and that was my outlet. I also hear something else coming up for you. You make this leap after your father passes Mm -hmm. in this pretty difficult environment. There's Mm -hmm. really not a whole lot of emotional outlets, but a superpower starts to show up in you, meaning receptivity and empathy. People are picking up on that and coming to you for support. You're connecting with the people that are available to connect with, right? But it also allows you to, to get a sense of identity around it. It's okay to be a little broken, I hear you saying. Number three, you have... What would be the quality I would call this? Resourcefulness and resiliency again, because you're in the midst of, it sounds like Alcatraz for, uh, in terms <laughs> of a religious experiences, right? In the midst of this chaos, you go, how can I take advantage of what this place is offering me? And you're seeing a, an open door for your own gifts in terms of performance. So yeah. res- resilience, empathy, and the performer starts to show up big time at this time in your life. Sound right? Yeah. So we went from how you show up, we get a deeper story in terms of your connection to community, where you make the leap from storytelling to uplifter. You take us back further in your story, where we go to your, this kind of just prolonged crucible experience, where you leap from a family where there's a, there's, there's a certain amount of carefulness in the culture, built into the culture of your family, deep connection with your father. He leaves but then you end up going to this 
organization or religious institution that's kind of an Alcatraz that's meant to kind of propel you into a place where you're better prepared for the world. Sounds like it was pure freaking torture, but you find a way to tap into resilience, empathy, and what would eventually become the storyteller that we're seeing in The Uplifter. Where do you start to get a sense that these gifts that you're, you're nurturing, empathy, um, the storyteller or entertainer, where do you start to get a sense that you could use these things in your life? I don't, not until later, because the whole, all the way through this process, even when I go to college, my mother wanted me to go to be a doctor, so, but I was not prepared simply because the Christian school education was not, they taught creationism and a whole bunch of other stuff which did not prepare me for, for you know, pre-med when I went to my first college in Indianapolis, Indiana. So clarity does not come until way later. Um, I'm lear- but I'm learning. You know, when I was a pre-med major, I'm learning a lot about the body. And when I took my psychology, first psychology class, because it was, you know, being a liberal arts education school, I had to do that. It set me on this journey because I had a lot of also – physical stuff. It's crazy. I can't even begin to tell you. I had a doctor that misdiagnosed an overactive thyroid gland as cancer when I was 16. So in the space of three months, I went through radiation therapy, chemotherapy, before we they settled on nuclear medicine for the treatment, right? Everything is off hormonally. And the, all the end result of all of that between my father and that is that I become clinically depressed. I would have been labeled manic depressive. So I am now, at 16, I was taking lithium and Valium. Like these were, you know, like lithium for some days and Valium for the other. And that's where the sensitivity came in, where I had to be aware and start to observe my own behavior. So in terms of like where this started to turn, it, it wasn't until actually way later, my 30s, but... I've been on this journey of healing and the, of the, with the mind and the body and looking at alternative forms of healing and medicine, I would say ever since my 20s. I always wanted to be an actor, and so I had to fight that and figure out how to negotiate that. And I got the courage to tell my mother, like after my first year, I don't want to be a pre-med major. Uh-huh. Right? So I want to be an actor. So I had been following, trying to follow the acting track I couldn't finish it for a for the reasons that you heard in the beginning of the Klansman story because I went to a school where all of that fell apart and I had to go back home to Evansville. So it wasn't until you know, somewhere in the 90s where I get back to I'm gonna go act. Having trouble telling how I feel, but I can dance, dance, dance. And that takes me to England, where I studied Shakespeare. And then that brings me to Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. And then I end up bouncing into New York. Dude, that whole time is this undercurrent of the need to fix what is wrong. I know that something's wrong, right? But no one would tell me anything. They, you know, people would just give me medicine. So I had to figure it out on my own. Meanwhile, that manic depressive bipolar pendulum is swinging. And I always knew that I only had like two and a half weeks where I would be present. So most of my adult life was planning for the days of lucidity and then mitigating what would happen next for the rest of the month. Boys can never think of what you do. So you're acting and eventually I ended up with a a job in television Mm -hmm. uh, because I had a, I started reading uh, copy for the blind at a radio station. So I went to work at an NPR affiliate part time news hour. That led to work at NBC and that was, Oh my God, I got into television production and it was crazy stressful. Television production is crazy stressful. I mean, now it's stressful, but before back then it was stressful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and became a film editor. I, w- I feel like Forrest Gump because I saw so many- <laughs> And I was a part of so many. I was. It was like I was there when Fox Television was born mm-hmm. because one of their first 
stu uh, studios, major stations was in Evansville, Indiana. They set up their pilot station in Evansville, Indiana. I went to work for them and I was a film editor. I used to edit The Simpsons with the Tracy Ullman show. So like I was there, like, and in the middle of all of that was still this relentless, I got to figure out because I was having back pain and I had the, like I said, I had the bipolar stuff, right? I, I was always isolated. You know, I would never go out to date. I never had too many friends because I knew that when the shift would happen mentally, right? It, I, I couldn't control either the emotions or the behavior. I would do things that would be what I would call out of character for myself. Now that you threw in the, the reality of the physical crisis that you've, you faced at 16 around the same time that you're in Alcatraz, um, yeah. it starts to make a little bit of sense because your superpower amongst all of that, um, empathy, stepping into the entertainer, people are coming to you for support and that kind of thing. Every time you came to the surface, right? Like let go of your carefulness a little bit. Mm -hmm. and step forward and maybe surrendered a little bit. What did you get? You got yeah. a shit storm, excuse my language, meaning yeah. like people were telling you what you were, Jezebel, you're sick, you're this or that, and it led to serious crisis. So you're the kind of person that would, could come up to the surface briefly. Very few people that you could touch base with were safe, and then you went back underground. So it's up, down, up, down. You spring out of that with fully loaded in terms of your capacities like as an as a, as an entertainer and your skill set probably empathy too when you chose to use it and you took full advantage of this but you're saying during that time it was a bit chaotic because you didn't really understand you understood the cycle of behavior but you didn't understand what was causing it and there was other symptoms around it yes so spring into new york i'm going to be an actress you push back you push from mom a little bit. You say, I'm willing to do this now. I'm going to become an actress or an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and you take on a series of odd jobs. You call yourself Forrest Gump. And it sounds like you're a bit of survival mode. Where does it go from there? Um, Where it becomes clear for you? Uh, it didn't until I was almost in my 40s. Well, I was. I was in my 40s, late 40s, in fact. Uh, I ended up getting caught in a dysfunctional job because New York became more and more about survival. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first got here, I was able to do jobs as an actress. I got two jobs in theater. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing because that's usually hard to get union work. Like that's the first thing you need to become a professional actor. And I got it six months after I was here. Wow. And then I got work as a... Uh, prop, a property design person. That was something I studied when I was at Sarah Lawrence. And I thought for sure, it's like, okay, then I can just stay in the arts. And it didn't happen. So I had to start to do temp work. And then after 9-11, I, I had a very good temp job. It was a, as a financial proofreader. And that, that paid really well. And you could leave and go do that. You know, you could go do art and then come back. And that work would be there. Well, after 9-11, all of that stuff, a lot of the corporations used 9-11 as an excuse to outsource and make things cheaper. So that whole world sort of disappeared. So basically what that meant is they didn't have to hire anybody in the industry doing what I did full time. So... I sort of ended up kind of getting caught up in that world, which meant I couldn't take off eight weeks to go do theater or even a film. When the storytelling came along, when this, it was a perfect fit for me because storytelling at the most would take me two or three days out um, because it, it, I wasn't away for a prolonged period of time. So that's how I ended up surviving. But this whole time, I'm not quite happy. And I've gone through like all of the generations of psychotropic drugs, right? And MAO, MMAO inhibitor drugs, right? At some point, I, it was like the best, the highest emotion that I could reach was apathy. Mm -hmm. And that happened, I think it was around 2012. I knew that the, this medication wasn't working and I went to go see, I was like, I'm sick of therapists because the regular forms of psychology were, was not helping me. 
So I went to this woman, this like new age woman. And I said, you know what, this, I, I don't want to live anymore. And she said, Steph, that's great. If you don't want to live anymore, that's fine. You add, suicide is a viable option. And when she said that, it was so funny because I was like, well, now I don't want to die anymore. <laughs> I don't want to sign up for living, for living. But it was just the saying it because I was very grave when I went to her. Yeah. And she said, before you consider that option, why don't you look at this? And that's when she gave me, uh, she, she introduced me to Abraham Hicks. Do you know who she is? Uh, I know who she is. Uh, Esther Hicks. Yeah. So Esther Abraham Hicks. is actually who, who yeah, she exactly. is. Good afternoon. We are extremely pleased that you are here. Yeah. So that is where the shift was made. And in fact, I want to do make a one woman show called How YouTube Saved My Life. <laughs> because that is exactly what happened. I mean, I had heard of YouTube, but I'd never really used it. And so this is now like 2010. And so I tuned into Abraham and what's interesting is that YouTube its algorithm will suggest similar things so I looked at emotional freedom technique and uh, faster EFT emotional freedom technique and matrix re-imprinting which is giving me all this stuff about inner child work and all these new age people have total like NLP and it's kind of imprinting stuff and I was like oh this is the stuff I need let me track for the listener again. So you, you leap into New York. It sounds like you, you're playing pinball with yourself for a while. Yeah. You know, trying to figure out where you fit. There's the jobs. The moment where everything seemed to shift for you was that suicide moment, meaning like, I'm going to state out loud what my real intention is, right? Yeah. You did, right? You're confronting your past, which is this. Everybody around me has control of what the hell I do, what I think, what, I'm, what I can be, right? That's what you really were pushing away from for a long time. Mm -hmm. You go through this roller coaster in terms of your own relationship to yourself to get this moment where this person just kind of allows you to have the control, full control, right? And you say, hey, wait a minute. I think I want to live. Things start to shift for you, right? You start to take control of your own health. You become the master of your own domain. You're a storyteller. That's come into focus, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you some more expanded freedom. Your inner life, your relationship to self is improving. What mm -hmm. else haven't we heard before we shift you into the now? Um, the, the thing that was biggest was that I cured my own depression. Getting back to YouTube, there's a woman named Amy Cuddy. Uh, and she talks about power posing. I don't know if you know what power poses are, but she did a study where uh, she studied primates and discovered that there are certain, the, the dominant, the alpha males have certain poses that they hold, which assert dominance. And she posited in her theory that if you did that with women, right? that it would change their belief, I'm paraphrasing all this, but it kind of changes the way they think and view themselves. And so I took that idea and ran with it. So when I was clinically depressed, I was looking for, I was like, in order for me to feel, I need to feel empowered. That was the thing, that was the goal to go after. And I need to have energy, but I need to have it on my own. So what I did is I kept looking through all these videos on YouTube with people in empowering poses. And I finally landed on one. It was the 1990 and 1988 Olympics, um, like highlights reel. And it's Whitney Houston singing One Moment in Time over this 88 Olympics highlight reel. And so you have all of these athletes in these poses. And I thought, well, I'm an actor. I can imitate this. So every morning I would get up before I went to work and I would imitate exactly what I saw in the video. So if there was a runner running towards the yellow tape, that's what I did. You know, and there were people jumping up and down after they made, you know, that perfect tennis hit and whatever it was. So that video, I kept playing it over and over and over again every morning, right? 
and imitating the expressions as well. That was the other thing that was really, really important was that I kept imitating the expressions. And so by doing that, and Tony Robbins talks about that, he talks about the idea of priming, right? So basically that's what I did is I would prime myself because I had no references for like happiness really in my own life that I could anchor things with, right? So that was the turning point. It still is kind of up and down, but from that point in 2010, I never had any problem with depression. And when I went to my doctor, he was like, in 2012, I went to my doctor and he said, okay, Steph, I will take you off of these medications because they were getting ready to put me on Lexapro by then. And I was like, I don't like this drug because it's a really slippery drug. I can't feel, we're now entering the world where drugs, you can't tell when they're working. The other ones I could tell when they were working. I could feel the switch. Like, and that's the way the packs were. Lexapro it was too slippery. So I was like, I can't tell if this is me behaving or the Lexapro me behaving. So um, I, he said, Steph, I will take you off of these after you see a, I, I don't know, like I had to see an actual psychiatrist, like a doctor that dispenses medicine, uh, a psychologist that dispenses medicine. And she, he said, after you see this person, if they think you are sane and sound and fine without it, then we won't have you on them. And that's exactly what happened. So ever since then, there's been no medication. So I was on medication ever since I was 16. And then when I got to whatever that was, 2012, I can't remember how old I was. I was 40 something. <laughs> so uh, 46, 47. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so the the journey that you're painting now, as we get to, we moved from how you show up, you took us into your past life to your recent past, is the journey back to sounds like to self, right? Where yeah, you're, you're you're taking full ownership of who and what you are. And you said your big leap for you was this giving yourself permission to act as if you were mimicking other people. Um, yeah, I think that story of the Olympics is fascinating. How how you how you determined that that was the place to go because in terms of images to attach to, there's probably not a higher image that you could attach to in terms of um, accomplishment and victory. Right. So your instincts lead you through this, this journey of from helplessness where everybody around you is determining who and what you are in terms of even your health, your sexual identity, pretty much everything. I will give you my take. I think your biggest leap was the suicide moment where you actually allowed yourself to die. Meaning, oh, wait a minute. I can do this. You gave over full control there, right? You just kind of surrendered in that moment and you took full permission to own your life again, right? So from mm-hmm. there on, things started to get easier. You went down this track where it sounds like you accessed more and more and more of your intuitional resources or just your resources as a human being to determine what's the right path for you. You took the role of healer. So where do you see yourself going today? What do you think we should know in that regard? Well, I think uh, what's really exciting is uh, I just took a class with the, uh, through the Actors Fund of America. It's a social services uh, organization for artists and it helps them with everything around their career. And one of the things they have is a career center. And I just took a creative entrepreneurship class. And the reason why I took the class is I wanted to explore this idea of becoming an inspirational speaker, particularly to use this story, the story, especially of the Klansmen to somehow bridge the gap with diversity and help to promote inclusion and equity, Um, especially in like Fortune 500 companies or companies where like in Silicon Valley or in the tech world or particularly the financial world where diversity and inclusion is still a challenge, Mm -hmm. right? Because my Klansman story in in essence doesn't have any villains and it doesn't preach. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to use it to kind of open up the door to have dialogue Mm -hmm. with people. 
who were somehow resistant. That's what happened at the mega church. And essentially what I'd like to do is have a business that replicates that same intention. That sounds like a wonderful opportunity Yeah. for you, but also for other people to look into. Another thing that I hear in terms of what you've offered here is when you're talking about diversity and inclusion, the courage that you showed here to really open up about your own mental health issues and how they relate to your life struggle, right? Uh, Yeah. Is potentially a pretty powerful thing on its own, um, kind of pulling back the curtain on what challenges look like and how they, how, what presents is difficult behavior or mental illness is also related to the paths that we lead. Um, I think you've done a good service here as well. So do you have any children? No. No children. Okay. Do you have nephews or nieces? Uh, I do. Yeah. Okay. So let's say it's 20 years down the road and you're sitting as CEO of your new enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. Finishing up some paperwork for the day, planning for a new presentation. Maybe it's for another mega church because you've seen that (laughs) the communities are actually open to having these conversations. Uh And your adult nieces and nephews walk in the door. Mm -hmm. and they're young adults. So they're a little bit confused by the idea of success, and they see you as a successful person. Mm -hmm. So they turn to you and and ask you a question. They say, you know what? I've been struggling with this idea of what success is, and we've been talking amongst ourselves, and we don't have any clue. We came to no conclusions. What would you tell your nieces and nephews that success is? Well, first of all, one of the things I I feel like is that success is measured from within. Because if you look at it with outside parameters from from the outside, it doesn't it doesn't tell the full story. Like in many ways I am successful. And I have to keep telling myself that because I'm and it's not just an overcoming. It's just that I have successfully achieved some things um, especially within in, in respect of mental health and integrating uh, I don't want to say integrating my personality but you know finding out who I am so there's that kind of success uh, I think that success has some uh, sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that's at, at, that's at the base of success however you define that Stephanie Somerville, thank you for joining us on the Pioneers of Insight podcast today. It was truly an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been wonderful. All right, folks, that's a wrap. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to. This just helps put it in the hands of the people likely to get something out of it. If you'd like to dig a little deeper and see what we got cooking here at TUI Media, you can visit our website at TUIMedia.com. Wishing you grace to fill your sails today. Stay great in the meantime, and I'll see you on the next Pioneers of Insight. Done. Now I don't want to die anymore. (laughs) I want to slap up for living, for living.